it's my pleasure today to have one of my favorite contemporary artists here and she has allowed us to go into a studio which actually is quite exciting especially in these covid times because i've got very used to my space and quite excited about going into somebody else's and she is an artist that uses multimedia we're going to be finding out what project she's working on a little bit about her techniques um, and there's a big question at the moment as we approach International Women's Day that um, female artists continue to be underrepresented within the art world. So she'll also touch on that and why she thinks that is the case. And she'll also be sharing some of her tricks to, um, that she uses in order to feel empowered. So uh, um, welcome, Liana. My studio, the first people here for a very long time. As you can see, there is good reason for that because um, it's a huge mess. I've had loads of shows postponed. And so all the work is kind of piled up and it's actually quite difficult to move. Uh, as you can see, uh, if you look around the corner, it, it, gets, it gets worse. <laughs> Um, but I've kind of made it work and it, it is it, it is quite uh, inspiring, you know, to be surrounded by all your stuff all the time. Um, I'm currently uh, finishing a project um, which I've been working on for quite a while. It's called Glorious Oblivion and it, it took me to lots of cities photographing statues of women. So I was looking for statues of historic women of which they're aren't so many and so uh, it felt like an interesting challenge to find them find out who they were why they had a statue and then within my work I, I, I kind of um, try to find ways of presenting something so that you are inspired to look at it again or perhaps in a slightly different way so to discover things and with this project particularly the challenge was that a lot of these statues are very inauspicious, um, not necessarily the most attractive objects, um, sometimes quite small and covered in pigeon shit and uh, some of them, uh, you know, very hard to find. It was, quite a, it was quite a hunt for these things, but I was very motivated. And so I went on like suburban trams and, you know, uh, to, to find busts of uh, obscure writers. Um, and so that project uh, obviously could have gone on forever. I, I chose seven cities, but you know, you could theoretically obviously do this for the rest of your life, which I intend not to do perhaps. Weirdly fortunate when the lockdown came, I had a period in London. So I did almost all the London shots in the first lockdown because I could cycle everywhere. There was no cars, there was no people, nobody was watching me <laughs> doing anything. And so that was really good. And I got um, the, all the London statues done. And then as I couldn't travel anymore, it was kind of the natural point to say, okay, uh, this, is, this, is the, this is the first body of work. So I've been putting the book together um, for, for those images. And um, yeah, you can have a look. Um, Cities Paris was one of the best ones. So essentially, uh, the, the the book is organized by how many statues of women the city had, and you know, like the the, the best one got the wins the prize and gets to go first, and then in order of of appearance, um, it goes downhill from there. <laughs> They're all capital cities, so they should all have lots but they don't all have lots. And it's very telling uh, in some ways who they commemorate to. Um, it's really fascinating. So this is a statue of Joan of Arc. She actually, um, she actually isn't called Joan of Arc because the committee thought she was, uh, she was too, a um, little too thrusting <laughs> to, be, to, to be a saint. And so they called her La France Renaissance, which I think, I think means, um, France um, reborn. Yeah, and those bikes were really there. People have asked me about, about that. They really were there. Brilliant, brilliant bikes. Mm -hmm. um, I did a lot of interventions, but I also did a lot of things like this one here, for example, which is the statue of Virginia Woolf, which I printed on a birch bark. So I did a number of these, uh, these pieces printing onto stone. Uh, printing onto um, cement, um, handmade marble, 
genuine marble. So I was, I was, I was really um, playing with the, the the sort of materiality of sculpture to try and you know um, try and talk about uh, the the nature of these objects. This is uh, Emmeline Pankhurst on a piece of onyx marble. Mm. And uh, yeah. And what's the, um, if you go back to that one, what's the dialogue between the statue and your interventions? Because you obviously, with this one, you've got the the, the statue um, as she stands up and that feels very believable, but then you've got this other human being that's almost lying at her feet, which is, which is your intervention. And what is it? Yeah, so there's a very, very skinny uh, doll, doll um, sort of languidly arranged between the plaque of Sylvia uh, and the statue of Emmeline. And the picture is called The Hunger Strikers. Um, I, I was making a reference to all the women that suffered very heavily for this campaign. Um, you know, I'm not suggesting that Emmeline Pankhurst didn't herself put a great deal in, but she did sort of, you know, um, lead a group of women who nearly starved themselves to death and, and, and indeed in some cases died. So this is her, and this is her, uh, this is one of these uh, hunger strikers there, slightly slightly fading on the wall. Yeah. It's, um, it, it's uh, a piece that I also, um, I also just wanted to, um, to kind of bring in the sort of complicated nature of these stories through the materials. So sometimes when the surfaces, you know, uh, uh, break up the images and make them less readable, I find that's kind of symbolically quite interesting. Mm. Because of course there's always a reason why statues are erected and it's usually not the one we'd like it to be. You know, she wasn't, she didn't receive a statue for, for being a, you know, a wonderful um, campaigner for feminism, but she got it because she joined the Tories. <laughs> Is that, is that true? Well, yes, yes. I mean, she she did, yeah. She did. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but I mean, she would never have got this prominent position otherwise. But there's also something in that piece about um, context as well, because you know the the statue feels from another world, from another era, and yet the figure figure that's lying at her feet is. From, from looking at the image on the screen, which I know is going to be very, very different, feels very, very contemporary. Right, well, yes, my, my dolls, generally speaking, are wearing my clothes. So they do, <laughs> they do tend to give away when that uh, took place. Yes, I also gave her short hair. So yeah, there is a kind of, um, you know, there's a kind of reference to where we are now. And in the sense, like the achievements that have been made. Um, standing in there, that they forged, they forged our path or our, our sense. And, and there is, yes, exactly. And, and may have had a huge impact. Uh, I, did, I did actually do one picture, um, which I might show you where I did really um, try to go for the um, period dress. Uh, this one here, it's, uh, I don't know if you read anything about this, this is the um, monument for Mary Wollstonecraft and it was all over the news for, for a, a, a couple of weeks because it, it's this kind of slightly unusual statue with this very small woman on the top. And the debate of course was interesting because it was sort of about the the nature of the monument, you know, but obviously Maggie Hamlin didn't want to make a, a statue of a woman in a frilly dress, understandably. And then when you come to the point that that the statue to a historic person is necessarily going to be a portrait of some kind, you really have an impasse. Mm. So here she is in her frilly, I mean, I did my best. Obviously, there is some net curtains involved. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it, it, I think especially in context with the other one, and it's the complete opposite. There's some. There's a really interesting. It's almost like it's a diptych. It's there's a really interesting conversation that's that that brings to light. Um, seeing one, seeing one next to the the other, and being like polar polar opposites of one another. 
Yes, also the statues themselves, of course, are kind of polar opposites in terms of approach. But it's it's funny how this one is actually kind of going back to an even, you know, pre more 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 um, distant age where women were largely uh, allegories, and there was a lot of allegorical statuary involving the female body. I did photograph a lot of allegories while I was traveling. It was hard to resist, you know, like in Madrid, there's a whole load of mermaids riding on giant seafood and stuff like that. So (laughs) really great stuff. But yeah, not in this project because all the women have to have at least an outside chance of having lived. I did did push it a bit here and there, but most of them have have lived, right? And, And tell me, like when, when did the like females as being um, central to your subject matter? When did that has that always been within your work, um, or is it something that's more recently been been involved? Like it's, you know, that's such such an interesting question that I literally have never asked myself. It's really weird. Um, you know, when I very first started being an artist, I was making kind of um, sort of semi-pornographic plasticine animation films. Almost everything I'd made was kind of about um, female sexuality. I mean, I was sort of lo- exploring the sort of, you know, what feels, I think, when you're young, like a sort of subject, <laughs> yeah, icky and complicated, but extremely interesting, right? <laughs> weird how weird how that sort of ceases to be interesting. But at the time, I mean, I was really exploring something complicated, and I think if that work had been done later, people would have talked about it as being feminist in Mm. nature. But when I started, feminism was definitely not a word that people were using and people were very, very anti, um, you know, that was just, it was, it was just that time, you know, where everybody was basically pretending that, that women's liberation was a thing that happened in the seventies and we're all done with it now. And all these, you know, um, and uh, it was also interesting. I recently spoke to uh, uh, another artist who was on my same course, who uh, is Asian, and she said it was the same with ethnicity. You you didn't talk about your gender and you didn't talk about your ethnicity because it somehow wasn't appropriate. You know, the idea that you would sort of talk about that it'd be sort of drawing attention to something that you didn't want to be in the forefront of people's mm-hmm. judgment. But of course, it also prevented us from realizing that we were in fact being massively discriminated <laughs> against. And we didn't realize, I mean, we had no idea when, when we entered the the world of art. We had no idea that we were going to um, to have a, 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 a very, we didn't, nobody t- told us that uh, there aren't really that many women at the top of the art world. You know, there was a sort of idea, well, just go and do it. You know, if you're good enough, you're gonna get there. Like, why do you, why do you think that is? Like International Women's Day is coming up. And why, why do you, why, why is it when art is so universal? I think there's something like 64% of, of women have been trained in art schools. And yet it's not reflected in, in, within the value system, within, within the art world and representation of women in galleries, et cetera. And why, why is it? What, what do you so I, I, I think that it is complex. I think there's a lot, there's a multiple re- reasons. And obviously there are lots of places in the world where the reasons are much, much uh, more profound than here, you know, where people just don't have any chance of, of either getting the education or getting the support to be professionals. Here, I would say that we, essentially what, we're, what you're looking at is a problem um, of value because people tend to uh, um, buy art um, as an investment even when they think they're not doing that or you know don't say that that's what they're doing they do they do do that and of course people do look at past performance to predict future future returns um, and 
you know, women haven't uh, obviously anywhere in history ever managed to make uh, any investor as much money as men. To break that cycle, I think that will take uh, a lot of time. Um, and also um, there is a kind of, um, you know, there's a kind of um, perception I think of women's work as being um, less valuable, even at uh, university level. I mean, if you look at how uh, female artists and how male artists price price their works when they graduate, it is there is already there a significant difference, and then the the that that expands uh, after they leave, and that of course makes them then unattractive to bigger galleries that need artists that sell for for for, for bigger money. Uh, but again, I do think that that goes back to historic fact that um, that generally, um, you know, there's a sort of uh, doubt about whether women's uh, art is, uh, is as valuable. I think it's that's all. There's something that you could say, okay, like if we could implement this. Um, okay. A chance of making just maybe a little iota of a, dis of a difference. So I think that the problem will sort itself out. Actually, I think without us doing anything over years, it will change because there have now been amazing female artists, and over the last few years, there have been enormous amounts of money made by people who bought, you know, Dorothea Tanning, and you know. Don Mitchell and, and there's a lot of painters whose work should have been extremely valuable wasn't really uh, appreciated for a very long time but continues to be there at, and to be seen and to be exhibited and then of course at some point suddenly these things catch up and have enormous value because there's a very limit, limited number of them so so once that happens I think it, the, the problem will fix itself you know of course men buy women artists I have many really uh, de dedicated uh, male collectors but in principle obviously if you have more women buying art they are also more likely to buy uh, the work of other women and to value the work of other women there's not going to be uh, um, as much of a sort of you know it's like it's like sport you know yes we, we like watching men's sport but we're more interested in women's sport aren't we because it's just you know just somehow so yeah we need to be represented and when once women have more share of the wealth i think all of these things will disappear that's what i hope anyway how about you what do you think what do we need to do Mm, as the, I've asked you the questions because I don't know the answer, <laughs> but um, I don't know. I think a lot of it is, I, th I think it's education and it's, it's um, I suppose it's always been aware of the difference. So like um, knowing what's on at the big museums, but then also knowing what's going on at the smaller galleries and understanding that both practices exist in the same space. And I think that the more open we are in what we look at and what we value and what we see, what we have around our home, I think, as you said, the it will happen, it will happen on its own. Uh, I think if you found that word got out that all the overlooked um, female artists of the last 30 years are suddenly doubling in price, you'd see a complete reversal of that trend. People would go piling in. And indeed that has actually that's a, that's a good art, that's a good tactic. <laughs> because it starts making you think about what's been happening in the stock market and the, with GameStop and all the rest of it. <laughs> That's what we. That's what we need to instigate. <laughs> now with COVID, uh, to, to you know, you sort of wonder whether all this is gonna put put us back a bit. Like that's what I worry about a bit. You know, because we we've had this period now where people who are looking after children or elderly parents have had a much harder time to get into the studio. Um, and you know, people who had a big market have continued to sell, but people who you know, were only emerging, had smaller galleries, um, haven't really been able to sell much. So I, I worry about that a bit that we're, we've taken a bit of a step back. Mm. So we need to, I think we need to get, get really get moving when this is all. Uh, yeah. Tell us, where can we find your work? 
um, at the moment because you and I know that you had some shows that were cancelled but um, I also know that you've got a couple of things coming up. Um, well I have got um, two shows that you can see on the internet both are with James Freeman Gallery who normally is in Islington um, near the Angel and rearing to reopen. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, jamesfreemangallery.com and the shows are called um, Electric Avenue and On Time um, and he's made some lovely videos about some of the works in order to sort of slightly help people bridge the gap um, between the virtual experience and the, the real artwork because of course a lot of my work is very tactile. I've done a lot of uh, fake cement pouring and stuff in the studio as well which has been a lot of fun you can see it. Uh, one of them back here um yeah the, the pieces are um are better when you see them in the flesh of course uh but uh it's it's gonna be over at some stage isn't it i'll show you another one while you're there <laughs> so this is uh this is um josephine Hi. on a piece of um marbled uh cement Mm. I mean that like you just don't know I mean that doesn't look like cement to me it looks uh it's almost like graf almost graffiti like um so basically what I do is I basically use like a marbling technique but rather than um normal marbling you 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 would um you make it uh it's it's basically sort of painted on as it were like you transfer it on mm -hmm. this is actually in the material. So I mix the different cements in different colors and then pour them out. There's actually on my Instagram channel, you can see a video of me actually pouring this particular piece. Wow. It's a complete mess, as you can also see in that video. <laughs> but these have been the things that I've been doing um, here. And, and uh, I sort of think in some ways I might not have done this if it hadn't been for lockdown because I've had so much studio time. Mm. I've gone, you know, oh, it doesn't matter if it doesn't work, you know, with no deadlines. So I've just done a lot of, um, done a lot of stuff. Okay. <laughs> I think that's part of the process though, Liana. <laughs> yes, it is. But um, you know how it is when you have deadlines, you just, yeah, have, to you just have to be more focused. on it. Yeah, so you can't, um, uh, you can't uh, just take as much time to experiment and explore. And my my statues, uh, you know, my women's statue project was so took so long and was so encompassing. In a way, it's also been really great to have time to think about what I'm going to do after. And also, like how to maximize all all, all of that time you spent um, looking for these sculptures, like what. I mean, it feels like you've just been exploring like what forms can they take and then what dialogues they can start speaking to one another and how they can have conversations and how those conversations then with the materials. Like it does seem like it's been quite an explorative sort of fun and really productive time. So I am looking forward to seeing that show. Your younger self, one piece of advice, what would it be? you would have known like if there's something that you kind of held you back and you just wish that you'd that you'd known there and then ha huh. yeah i wish i'd known uh that um i pro yeah i wish i'd known that there is no real magic about uh, anything that that the the works that um, you know the artists whose work you love uh, achieve that by uh, hard work and experimentation and that everything and there is a you know there's a there's a practice behind everything I, we were taught in a very strange way when I was an art student and it was very disjointed and the theory was pretty much irrelevant to the practice and the practice wasn't really discussed at all so in a sense I think in a way um I wish I'd had the kind of uh, art history based art education much much earlier that I'm giving myself now I mean I've I've spent you know a lot of time because I'm teaching online you know looking at lots and lots of artists reading about them listening to interviews and videos with artists and you know 
And that's been to me incredibly inspiring and hugely enjoyable. And you just, you know, you, you realize that the, the day to day difficulties, the processes, the decision making, everyone has to everyone has to fix it and everyone's life interferes with their work it's just how it's how it is and some of these people overcome you know odds that just feel incredible to me and yeah so that's what I wish yeah I'd go back to my younger self and let, make myself read a whole different set of books yeah. <laughs> behind every real really truly great work is a lot of support and I think that's the thing that we do always have to remember is if you give an artist uh, or a writer or a designer a budget and a team what they're going to produce is obviously going to be much better than what they produce uh, on their own with no money and that looking back through art history that is the big problem we can never really we can never really fix those great big holes that we have in the voices of the past because the potential of so many people was never realized and that happens now you know so if 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 you if you think about the great works of genius the first stuff that comes to mind is stuff that's huge and cost you know, half a million pounds to make. Mm. The, the person didn't get there on their own. They had a probably, a, you know, a good career and they were doing well, but they got support, they got commissioned, they got money, they got people, they had people behind them. And that's how you get to a point where you can realize really ambitious and great ideas. And, you know, it's obviously not going to be everyone who, who manages to get to that place. And, and, but it's, I think it's really important to, I think, just dispel that there is even such a thing as genius. We've just um, moved it again and we're hoping it's gonna take place in July. Fingers crossed. And, and then it will be in the gallery and there will be careful social distancing in place, but works can be viewed in person. And in the meantime, I really suggest you follow Liana on her Instagram Instagram account. I don't want to get it wrong, Liana, so over to you. Uh, the Instagram account is Liana Lang Studio. Um, yeah, and um, thanks so much, Ash, for having me. Fantastic fun to chat to you. And um, 